Good morning, FCF Church. <laughs> you know, we were able to get a hundred more chairs. We thought we got to find a way to do this. So we stretched our aisles and we pushed things around and got a hundred more chairs. And based on what I'm seeing, we needed every single one of them. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Huge shout out to our auditorium hosts who are helping seat people. We still have people coming in. We, we appreciate your patience as we address a, a fantastic problem, amen, that people are coming to church to celebrate what God is doing. So my name is Pete. I have the incredible privilege of serving here as the associate pastor. And if this happens to be your first Sunday, myself and our lead pastor, Pastor Randy, we'd love to have the opportunity to meet you following service in an area called Guest Central right over here. You can meet us and ask any questions that you have about the church. God is doing something very special in our church. It's a great church. And great churches don't happen by accident. Amen? Great churches are the result of great leaders. And we have a fantastic leader in Pastor Randy. Can you let him know how much you love him? How much you appreciate? Yeah. His faithfulness to the call. Yeah. So how many have been to a baptism service before? Go ahead and stick your antenna up in the air. Okay, how many are brave enough to say you've had a question about baptism before? My, my hand is up. My antenna is up in the air. You've had a question before. If I'm honest, I'd say I had a lot of questions initially. And adults, we think about questions, right? But kids, they verbalize those same questions, Right? And I'm gonna tell you a story. The names will remain anonymous to protect the child and the parent. But it's a true story about a, a five-year-old girl who was watching a baptismal service or parts of a baptismal service and was, was deeply, deeply confused by what she was seeing. And she approaches her father and she says, she says, Daddy, I don't understand. Why do we keep pushing these people underwater? And um, I said, I'm sorry, the parent said, <laughs> he thought that he had articulated, it was quick. I had a quick second to get it in there. And I, she, I'm sorry, the parent had a quick second to get in there and said, look, these people have chosen to leave a previous life and to step into a new life. And they're, they're going to make good choices and not bad choices. And, and, and he felt pretty good about what he had shared with the young girl. And he realized that he had some more work to do because when the young girl was going to bed, she said, um, you know, Dad, I've been thinking about this a lot. And you panic if you're a parent and your kid says that. She says, if we really want these people to be good, I'm not sure that a bath is going to do it. We're, we're probably going to have to spank them all. So instead this morning, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> There's confusion around baptism. Who do we baptize? How do we baptize them? When do we baptize them? We believe, we teach here, baptism by immersion. The reason is because the word that we get, baptizo, comes from the Greek and is transliterated into baptism, which means to dip or immerse. But some believe in, you know, they're going to pour water on you. That's a fusion. Some throw water, just throw water at you. That's aspersion. But we believe that this and what this pictures is the best representation of the first century. But the question I want to ask is why is there so much confusion in reference to baptism? Anytime I'm teaching on a topic or any topic, I like to not just look at what we teach, but to understand misinterpretations, confusions, and there's no shortage in reference to baptism. There's lots of confusion. Why is that? Why is there so much confusion? I want you to hold that thought because we're going to come back to it at the very end. Why so much confusion in reference to baptism? Okay, Matthew 28, 19. We're going to start here. This is some of the last instructions that Jesus has given to his disciples before returning to heaven, before the ascension. Powerful. I'm actually going to start you at 28, 18. We don't have that, but it's Jesus. He says, 
All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus speaking. And then he speaks to the disciples. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. What is it? Them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to everything I've commanded you. Like this was a big deal. Some of the last instructions Jesus gives to his disciples. And he says, baptize them. So what is baptism? What does it symbolize? What does it mean? At FCF, we teach that baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. If you have your, your flyer in there, we have fill-ins. This, this is one of your blanks. You can fill in your outline. It's an outward sign of an inward work. And while it's symbolic, it's more than just symbolism. And this morning, we're going to look at three distinct interconnected thoughts that Scripture teaches us in reference to baptism. And the first one is this. Baptism expresses publicly. Baptism was the first step for a first century Christian. It was the public profession of their faith. Several passages demonstrate this, but we're going to run four passages from Acts in sequential order, and you can see this. Those who accepted were, what is it? Baptized. Acts 8.12. Those who believed Philip were? Come on, you can do better than that. Acts 8.13. Simon believed and was? There we go. Acts 8.36. This is the, probably the best picture of it because once the Ethiopian government official decides, man, I'm going to follow Christ, his, his question is, what prevents me from being baptized? Why? Because this was universally practiced by first century Christians. It was the first step of obedience among first century Christians, and there was no such thing as an unbaptized first century Christian. And this is what you might miss, and this is a big deal. For a first century Christian, this public profession of their faith would be the thing that might cost them their life. It wasn't just getting dipped in a tank in front of people. It was potentially putting your life on the line for obedience. Uh, it doesn't matter where anybody else goes or what anybody else does. Father, I'm following you, even if it costs me my life. Yet, they were obedient. And conversely... I think it's possible that we have the largest group of unbaptized Christians in the history of the world. And a, a lot of churches are drifting away from baptism. And here's my concern. Here's our concern. A church that ignores baptism is a church that may be looking to draw a big crowd without encouraging any public profession of your faith. And that was never what it was supposed to be about. Th there's a, a push. Comfort over obedience. You don't hear a lot of personal obedience messages. Nobody likes to hear that. So they tell people what they want to hear. That has never been the heart of our lead pastor, and I love you for it. Do you love him for it? He's going to give you some meat and some veggies. Um, how many are married in the room? Don't, don't be shy. You make your partner nervous. Go ahead, throw your paw. Yeah, there you go. All right. How many wear a wedding ring? Jessica's been shrinking my clothes. I think she sh shrunk my ring too. There we go. So this, this ring does not make me married. This ring shows others that I'm married. Now imagine if I go up to Jessica, and we've been dating for a while, and I say, I love your heart. You're, you're, you're the most beautiful person I've ever met in my life. I just, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I can picture you singing with a pot in your hand, dancing around our kitchen. <laughs> I'm looking for a new place to stay. If anyone has 
a room for rent. <laughs> I want to marry you. I want to spend the rest of my life in covenant relationship with you. But here's the deal. I don't want to tell anybody. I want, I want to keep it on the DL, on the down low. Anyone, everyone would say, what kind of a covenant is that? What kind of relationship is that? Jessica would say, you Italians are all the same. <laughs> this ring is a sign that forever my life is pledged to someone, a public sign. And baptism is a public sign that your life is forever changed. That you are pledged to someone. Matthew 10 says it this way. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Baptism is a public sign. You say, but Pastor Pete, if I stand up and get baptized, everybody's going to see me. That's the point. <laughs> Our first point, I'm going to move quickly here. Baptism expresses, what is it? Publicly. Baptism expresses publicly transformation that's taken place spiritually. It's a physical picture of a spiritual reality. It's public to all, but it's personal to you. You've changed the way that you think. You've changed the way that you feel. You no longer trust yourself, but you trust Christ and his plan. You could never talk me out of Jesus. Do you know why? Because Jesus happened to me. He so impacted my life that I will never be the same. And baptism is a picture of death and resurrection. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Baptism expresses publicly. Let's look how Romans 6.1 says this. I think I broke my remote when I punched that. There we go, still working. <laughs> what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that... That's where you want to point at and don't say anything. That's where you say it. Continue to sin that grace. may abound. If you did not see Pastor Randy's teaching on grace, the Bible Institute, go back. It's on our YouTube channel. It's, it's fantastic. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? Pause. Paul uses this expression from time to time. Do you know what I've realized? Th this is a rhetorical question. Because I feel like when I read this in scripture as a pastor, most people, whatever he's getting ready to say, most people don't know. They're missing it. Let's continue. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were, what's the word? Into his death. Okay, we see this picture of death and resurrection taking place. Verse four. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Old Pete goes down new peak comes up, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in the newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is passed away and the new has come. And that is what baptism is communicating. Now, if you haven't gone all in for Jesus... Those that are being baptized, if you haven't gone all in for Jesus, I'd encourage you, don't bother being baptized because all that's going to happen is you're just going to get wet and there's nothing inherently spiritual about a bath. Add as many candles as you want, throw salt in it, it's still not spiritual. Nothing transformational is going to take place in this tank, but this is the picture of what's taking place, death and resurrection. Therefore, we bear with him through baptism. Baptism expresses, what is it? Publicly. Transformation that's taken place spiritually. And this is where we're going to live for a couple minutes here. Demonstrated by obedience personally. Personal obedience. If there was a concept that I felt like most people are running from, it's this. Personal obedience. I think it's actually where most Christians get lost. And there's so much confusion and so much bad teaching in reference to it. Let's start here, Colossians 2.12. Now, regardless 
regardless of what you've been taught, I want you to, the same way we should every time we look at Scripture, come at it objectively. Let Scripture interpret itself. Let's look through this lens. Colossians 2.12 says, For you were buried with Christ when you were... And with him you were raised to new life because you... The mighty power of God. This is that picture. Your trust has shifted. You no longer look to yourself. You're looking to Christ. Let's look at Romans 1.5. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles. Gentiles were people that were outside the religious circle. They weren't born in the right family. They didn't fit. But that didn't matter to Jesus. Gentiles. He called them to the obedience that comes from now, this is the word pistis, and we talk about it all the time. Pistis means faith, trust, reliance. It's not an ethereal concept or some collection of facts about Jesus. That's not what it means to be a Christian because I believe in Jesus. That's not what it means. It's the difference between believing in something and putting your trust in someone. I'll read you some passages that are a little bit difficult. But don't get mad at the Italian preacher. It's in the book, all right? 1 John 2, 4 says, He who says, I know him, this is a relationship word, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. This, that's a rough word. We don't even let our kids say that word. And the truth is not in him. God says, do you know me? Are you in relationship with me? Because if, if you do, you'll keep his commandments. Now this next passage I'm going to show you is probably the most succinct and clear in reference to this. Hebrews 5, 9. He, Christ, became the source of eternal salvation for all who go to church. He became the source of eternal salvation for all those who pray. Uh, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who parroted a prayer. He became the source for all those who believed a collection of data about the historical Jesus. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who, what is it? Okay. It breaks my heart for somebody to believe that they are in covenant with Jesus but they're not because they never obeyed. Now, anytime I'm going to study a passage, I read it in six translations, at least. The six that I go to, everybody has their own favorite. I go to King James, New King James, New American Standard, NIV, New Living, and the Amplified. That's generally what I read almost every time. This verse is translated identically. Do whatever you want to it. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey. Here's what I'm saying. Saving faith always leads to obedience. Salvific faith is found in obedience. Obedience is the acid test of our trust. We have so many Christians that are just like, you know, I wonder how close to the edge could I get if I put my foot here, balance, and still be a Christian? What commandments I mean, I believe information about you. What commandments can I break and still be in covenant with Christ? What if, what if I was thinking, how close could I be to another woman and still be married to Jessica? That's not how this works. Christ says it this way, John 14, 15. If you love me, you're going to keep my commands. Now, this is something, I'm going to show you something. Pastor Randy and I have talked about this so many times. This feels so challenging to illustrate. No matter how many times we say it, I feel like people still miss it. So this is something that God placed on my heart a couple of days ago. I'm going to show you it. It's called the cycle of trust. Cycle of trust. It's not the circle of trust. That's Robert De Niro, meet the parents. That's a different, we're not talking about that. It's the cycle of trust. It's as clear as I can possibly show you this. You have information, it's just you or someone, 
They're going through life and they get information about the historical Jesus. It, he existed. You can't deny it. He is a historical character that you can see. You get information about the historical Jesus and you're going through life. All of a sudden, you follow Christ because you trust him. You take the information about Jesus, you put your trust in him, and you follow because you trust. And trust is demonstrated by obedience. If you trust, you will obey. If you trust, you will obey. God says to do it, you do it. God says, don't do that. But you're like, I really like doing that. And he says, no, that's going to hurt you. But man, I really like sleeping with my girlfriend. That's going to hurt you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I love you. I want what's best for you. Because I trust, I'll obey. So I go to the doctor. I say, I have a stabbing pain in my lower right or left. Out. Where's your appendix? Is it here? Right side. Okay. I say, I have a stabbing pain in my right abdomen. He says, you have appendicitis. We're going to split you open. We're going to yank the organ, throw it away, sew you back up. You'll be just fine. And I say, you're going to take an organ out of me, a part of me out? I say, yeah. What? Why was it there to start out with? We don't know, but we're going to do it. If I trust the doctor, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what he says because trust is demonstrated by obedience. We follow because we trust, and trust is demonstrated by obedience. And obedience is the mark of a Christ follower. All our verses. Who follows because they trust, and trust is demonstrated by obedience. And round and round we go. This is what it looks like to be a Christ follower. And the more, this is what you'll notice in your life. The more you go around this circle, the more you are becoming like Jesus. You follow because you trust, and your trust is demonstrated by obedience to him. And obedience is the mark of a Christ follower. This is what it means to be a Christian. But here's the problem. There's a gospel right now that doesn't include the word repentance. Repent and be baptized, Scripture says, over and over again. And repent means to turn. To turn away, to turn. And here's what's happened to a lot of Christians. They had information about the historical Jesus, but they never turned. They never made this turn. They didn't take information about someone and turn it into trust in someone. And they kept on going, all the while thinking, I'm good. I got this. Belief in a historical character does not have saving power. You believe in Jesus? The, the church struggled with this too, and James addresses it in 2.19. You believe in one God? He says, good. Even demons believe that. There's not saving power in a belief. There's saving power in trust. So PG, you're saying that salvation is a, is a, baptism is a condition of salvation, and no. At FCF, we teach that it is trust in God alone that carries salvific authority or saving power. It is trust in Him that carries saving power. And in reference to baptism, again, there's all sorts of teaching that's out there in reference to the saving power of baptism. The clearest picture of this is in Luke 23, 43. It's the thief on the cross. And the thief's on the cross. He sees Jesus and he says, I believe you are who you say you are. Surely you are the Son of God. And Jesus would love to have him enter into his kingdom, but he can't. He says, you know, I'd love to help you, but we're on a hill. I don't see any water. I can't baptize you. Take the elevator marked down. No. He put his trust in him. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Now what I'm going to say next is the kind of clip that gets chopped out of context, thrown online, and labeled heresy. But it's not. It is taught through the entire council of Scripture. It's not popular, but it is taught. Got your attention, right? You guys with me? 
Is baptism a condition of salvation? No. Baptism isn't an issue of salvation. Baptism is an issue of obedience. But obedience is an issue of salvation. Baptism isn't a condition of salvation, but it will show the condition of your heart. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. As Pastor Kim said, we have 50 people to baptize, over 50 people that are scheduled to be baptized. Isn't that fantastic, church? I'm going to recap my points real quick, and then we're going to start celebrating. Baptism expresses, what is it? Publicly. Transformation that's taken place spiritually. And it's manifested or demonstrated by obedience personally. Personal obedience. So go all the way back to the beginning. The final words of Jesus before he returns to heaven. What does he call the disciples to do? How important is obedience therefore go and make disciples of all nations what's the word baptizing them in the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and teaching them to Amen. say it louder so no you're teaching them to Amen. this is what it means to be a christ follower not a collection of data so we go all the way back to the question that I initially started with. Why so much confusion in reference to baptism? This is what I believe. This is why I believe there is so much confusion around this topic. Because biblically, baptism is a person's very first step of obedience once becoming a Christ follower. Baptism is a person's very first step once committing to be a Christ follower. And the devil wants to break the cycle of obedience as soon as he can. So if he can derail you at embryo stage, he's already won. Now, we have an odd phenomenon taking place in our churches, and I alluded to it earlier. Modern day evangelical circles there are people who profess to be Christ followers, which is a life that is marked by obedience, right? Trust, follow, obedience. Obedience is the mark of a Christ follower. But they've never taken the very first step of obedience that God has called us to. Here's what's exciting. We are going to offer everyone in this room that step this morning. We have... Shorts, we got shirts, say I have decided, we got towels, there's the shorts, we have hair dryers in case you want to do your hair, we got scope for some reason, I'm not sure what that's going to do, deodorant will be helpful, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, toiletries, whatever you need, we have it. That's how important we believe this step is. And maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I've never been baptized. It's too late now. I'll share this. One of my closest friends, I've known for about 15 years, got baptized about four months ago. And no part of me was thinking, why'd he wait till now? What happened in me is I stood there trying to lead worship with tears running down my cheeks excited about what God was doing, new and afresh in his life, and what God was going to do. And this morning, we want to offer everyone that opportunity. If you've never taken this step of faith, I don't care if you were baptized as a child. Scripture doesn't teach that. I don't care if you were sprinkled or you were born in your family's pool. If you were not baptized by immersion, after making a conscious decision of your own, which infants can't make, to follow Christ, we believe that the first step of obedience that you should take is baptism. So once we get rolling here, Miss Danny and, and Miss Joan are going to be over there. They'll wave at you. You can go see them. They'll get you all of the stuff you need. We'll dunk you, let you dry off, and you can drive all the way home soaking wet singing. Amen?
I'd also say this, just because you didn't schedule this doesn't mean that God didn't appoint it. And, and this morning, there's going to be all sorts of video that's taken. And if you want to share it with others, you can share it. You want to, I want these people to be all, I get all that. Take this step. They're going to gather right over here when we start. I, I feel like there's, there's one more group that I, I just want to speak to briefly. And, and you're the group that maybe... Like you would like to hang out with Christians and you come to church, but you never made that turn. You, you never said, you know what, God, I, I've been doing this my way for too long, but because I trust you, I, I'm, I'm going to do this your way. And maybe for you, that day is today. And you want to commemorate that in some way, I want to encourage you to be baptized as well. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for what you're doing in the lives of these people. We celebrate your faithfulness. God, it is so exciting to talk about life change, but it is transformational to see life change. And this morning, God, we celebrate every single person that said, I've decided to follow you. I don't care where everybody else goes. God, I'm following you freely, fully, forever. I'm dedicating my life. I'm going under this water one way and I'm coming up a new person. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. amen.